And I suppose the best thing to do, first of all, us, is to say, who or what is Isis? Well, if we look into the ancient records of Egypt, Isis was a goddess of ancient Egypt. Um, that was her Greek name, actually, uh, known better to the Egyptians as Saset or A-S-T, or whatever. But of course, that's not the Isis we're talking about. That's a long, long time ago, isn't it? Uh, the Isis we're talking about is that fanatical group that uh, have taken power in the Middle East and seem to be taking over whatever parts of the world they can. ISIS is known as the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, to give it its full title. Sometimes it's abbreviated to IS, um, and there are other names for it as well. I initially, this group was uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, it then became ISIS in 2013. Also, ISIL is another name it's known by, and then just known as Islamic State, or IS. So, this ISIL refers to the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. And if you've never heard the term Levant before, we'll show you that in a moment or two. But this is the area which appears to be under ISIS control at the moment. The red area is their heartland, and the yellow area is where they are making excursions into. And uh, they are taking over, quite rapidly, areas in the Middle East. And fighting in the Middle East, in Syria particularly, today, it involves ISIS. Now, we said it's also <coughs> called ISIL, uh, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, or Levant. And where is this famous Levant? And um, It's that area of the Middle East, the green area there. And notice the green area includes the land of Israel. So that's the territory that they want as their heartland, and it includes the land of Israel. Now, in fact, if you look at that area there, which is generally agreed as the Levant in modern terms, and you compare it to the promises to Abraham, well, it's remarkable, isn't it, that the land promised to Abraham was uh, much larger than the land of Israel today, and in fact, it just about corresponds to that area known as the Levant today. And the Bible tells us that one day that will be Israel's and part of the kingdom of God. So this Islamic State then, what are they up to and what are they doing? Well, Islamic State established a caliphate. Now, a caliphate is uh, a special form of Islamic government led by somebody who's called a caliph. And a caliph is a person who is considered to be a political and religious successor to the Prophet Muhammad, and therefore as uh, his legal successor is the leader of the entire Muslim community. So it, the Islamic State have decided that they're going to establish a caliphate, and they've got someone who claims to be this person who uh, is a uh, successor to Muhammad. And uh, the state believes that it's the duty of all Muslims to come from everywhere they are in the world and come and take residence in their own land and renounce citizenship of that other nation they've come from. And it regards any form of government other than its own as a curse to Islam. So you see, these are very fanatical views and views which are very alarming to much of the world today. So a caliphate requires, first of all, a state that can be governed. It wants territory. It also wants a legitimate caliph as leader. Emphasis on the word legitimate. It has to fill all these various criteria. It wants to impose judges and taxes, taxes on its people in accordance with this strict law the Sharia law, and it therefore becomes the duty of every Muslim to migrate there and support its growth. And it invokes and involves this 7th century law of Muhammad, and that law, according to the Muslims, cannot be altered, and you cannot deviate from it. So it sounds very alarming, doesn't it?
And indeed, it is. And uh, these leaders today of ISIS think they're on a course for a great battle. They call it an apocalyptic battle, battle with their enemies. And they believe that this battle is something they'll win and they'll gain the victory. So again, very alarming. And uh, this IS, or Islamic State, claims to be the sole representative of true followers of Islam and is executed large numbers of Muslims whose understanding of the Quran differs from their own narrow interpretation. So they're all Muslims, but they're executing each other. So it's a dreadful picture. This is what they think that they can do. And this gives us the true uh, alarming facts about this particular group of people. So we might ask the question, is IS part of Al-Qaeda? Well, it actually began as an offshoot from Al-Qaeda, but it was rejected by Al-Qaeda initially. And uh, Al-Qaeda rejected it because it complained that ISIS was too brutal. And sure enough it is, isn't it, with the picture I've just shown you. And they complain that the focus on establishing a caliphate has distracted from the push into Syria. So that rejection means that Al-Qaeda, uh, their representation in Iraq, now has limited effect. Uh, whereas Islamic State is a significant challenge to those who are controlling Iraq. So you have uh, a lot of trouble there in the Middle East, and the man in charge of IS is this fellow here, Baghdadi. Uh, he's also known as Abu Dua, and he's the head of Islamic State. And people regard him as one of the most powerful jihadi leaders in the entire world. And he's been in charge, he, he was leader of Al-Qaeda in 2010, after all the former leaders were killed in an attack by U.S. and Iraqi troops. And now he's come and he's leader of Islamic State. So how big is this Islamic State? Well, that's a big question, isn't it? Because U.S. spies have told us that there are about 31,000 IS soldiers, militants. Um, Two-thirds of those are foreign fighters. Whereas Kurdish leaders claim the figures more like 200,000. So, the coming nightmare, says that uh, graphic at the bottom there. And sure enough, it is for many of the people, especially in the Middle East. So this caliphate that is formed by IS or ISIS is a radical Islamic group. It's killed thousands of people since it's, uh, it's formed its caliphate in June 2014 and it's taken Raqqa as its capital city. And Raqqa is here uh, in the heart of Syria. So you have effects here that are, are taking place today because IS wants to expand its territory and we're here on the news now of fighting in Aleppo, which are a little bit further north in Syria, and we'll come on to that in a moment or two. But IS has its claws throughout the rest of the world. So perhaps when we woke up on the 13th of November last year and we saw the news reports of terror in Paris and the effects of that, it might have been a great shock to us. But this is what IS does. It invokes terror and it attacks anybody willingly uh, who doesn't agree with their beliefs and doesn't support them. So a recent map will show a completely more greater picture of where they're doing. This is a group who will stop at nothing to have their own way. And uh, there you see a, a map of Europe, and you've got attacks in Germany, attacks in Belgium, attacks in France, attacks in Turkey, and who knows where they're going next, because the news always, every week, has some new place that has suffered terror <coughs> as a result of these people. There's no doubt they're growing rapidly. And uh, a couple of maps here will show you that on the left is a picture on the, 20, on the 31st of August in 2014. And then the one on the right is just six months later. So that red area was all gained in a period of six months. 
And notice there's the city of Aleppo now on the right-hand side, right on the border, on the edge of the territory, the heartland of Islamic State. And so the fighting that we've seen in Aleppo, yes, well, there seems to be, it's difficult to work out who's fighting who, isn't it? There seems to be lots of terrorist groups in Syria who are fighting the government or each other, uh, and the Russians are moving in, and the Russians are doing all sorts of things. But the news bulletins on Sunday and Monday were saying that IS was now gaining control of the outskirts of uh, Aleppo and was moving in to take that city. So Aleppo is also one of the aims of ISIS. And uh, the aims of ISIS, well, here's a poster. We will conquer Jerusalem, O Jews. We will conquer Rome, O Christians. So whoever isn't a Muslim is in danger of being conquered. And uh, for the people in Israel, they must feel pretty threatened at the moment with this alarming increase in size and the aims of ISIS. Uh, our expansion also tells us that um, in 2014, um, the supporters of Jerusalem, which is the most jihadist organization in Egypt, they pledged allegiance to IS. So Egypt, at the other side of the picture, who is the other side of Israel, rather, and you've got IS in the north and you've got Egypt in the south, well, now Egypt has decided they're joining up with Islamic State, and uh, they therefore are, are like regarding Israel as uh, the meat in the sandwich, and attacking from both sides. So this group, it uh, has a special appeal because, you know, it's got a religious background, and uh, particularly young people that are impressed by this fervency, and the impressionable young Muslims are lured to Syria and to Iraq. And there they become radicalized and fight for their cause, many of them losing their lives. So if we were to summarize what ISIS is planning to do, then I came across this. And this is what you find alarming. Because this is what ISIS hopes to have gained by 2020, in just four years' time. The black area there includes the, the whole of northern Africa, includes the whole of the Middle East, and it extends into uh, Iraq, Iran, and it also extends into southern Europe and Spain. That's what they hope to get their claws on within just four years. But most importantly, notice there, there's no land of Israel. Israel has vanished in their dreams there's no Israel there where Israel should be. So their intentions are pretty plain. Uh, they want control of much of the world, and they especially want to push Israel into the sea. So who are the members of ISIS? Well, they come from the ranks of this particular party, which was Saddam Hussein's party, and uh, it's all coming really from what happened in the Gulf Wars of 15, 20 years ago, and uh, the people who were high up officers in ISIS uh, were originally there in this party of Saddam Hussein. It's estimated that there are 12,000 foreigners, and 3,000 of those are Westerners, have joined ISIS. So how big will ISIS get? Uh, we just don't know. And we have to ask the question, and I think it's a very fair question to ask, will ISIS be the power in the last days which will make war with Israel and win? Because that's what they intend to do. So let's just look at things from a scriptural point of view. Because the scriptures are, I believe, quite clear that coming soon <coughs> there will be some kind of war in the Middle East, and it's a war which Israel will lose. And the land which they've uh, enjoyed and rejoiced in and expanded all these years since their independence as a nation will be taken from them. And we get this from Zechariah. We, we read it Zechariah 12, but let's look at Zechariah 14 as an introduction. Because 
Zechariah 14 tells us that, you know, the day of the Lord's coming, so it immediately sets the time frame for this. It's relating to the day of the Lord. Uh, uh, when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst, midst. For God says he will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. And notice that this group of people who attack Israel are successful. Because the city is taken, the houses are plundered, the women raped, and half the city goes out into exile. And some of the people won't be cut off from the city, it says. So it's quite clear that um, in Zechariah 14... You have a picture of an attack against the land of Israel in the time of the end, which is successful and which takes Israel into captivity. Now, we sometimes make the assumption that Zechariah 14 is telling us about the same events as Ezekiel 38. But really, they can't be, can't possibly be, because Zechariah 14 is a <laughs> successful attack against the land of Israel, Ezekiel 38, which depicts Russia and our allies attacking Israel, is a failed attack. The plan set in motion in Ezekiel 38, but the people are defeated and don't get anywhere near Israel. Yet here in Zechariah 14, they actually enter Israel and Jerusalem in particular, take the city and take a great spoil. And in case we want to debate who all these nations are that are mentioned in Zechariah 14, then Zechariah 12, which describes the same event, uh, tells us, uh, verses 2 and 3, the passage we read as the introduction, Behold, I'm about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding peoples. And it mentions the siege of Jerusalem that would be against Judah, and on that day will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the people. All who lift it will surely be hurt themselves, and all the nations of the earth will gather against it. But initially, this is the surrounding people, and it's the siege of Jerusalem, because the siege is mentioned in Zechariah 14. And uh, you have the nations of the surrounding nations coming against the city of Jerusalem and against the people of Israel. And uh, you also have a mention in Zechariah 13 that the effect of all this will be dreadful so that two-thirds are, are going to perish in the land. Now, Zechariah 12 and 14 are telling us about that same event, which also seems to be what Psalm 83 is talking about. People who have a grudge against Israel and want to cut the name of Israel off from being a nation anymore. And it lists a lot of nations like Edom, the Ishmaelites, the Moabites, Hagarines, Gebel, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, Tyre, and Assyria. And in modern terms, you know, you've got southern Jordan, uh, you've got central Jordan, Egypt, Lebanon, uh, the Sinai Peninsula, the Gaza Strip, Iraq, and bits of Syria. Uh, in other words, you've got a map presented in Psalm 83, much like this which depicts surrounding nations having an attack against Israel, which appears in Psalm 83 to be successful. And uh, I believe it's talking about the same event as Zechariah 14. So what we have to say is, could it be these people, ISIS, who are the perpetrators behind this attack predicted here in the pages of Scripture? You see, ISIS has taken over everywhere in the Middle East. It uh, has taken over campaigns in parts of Iraq and Syria. It's been trying to get some ground in northeast Lebanon uh, and northern Lebanon. It's also got into the Gaza Strip, and they've given Hamas a run for the money. They've had a launch of uh, an attack in Sinai Peninsula. And of that list then, all we're left with is Jordan and the Iraqi border, and they've also been affected. So of all those nations in Psalm 83, then ISIS has got its talons into all of them. So these nations that are round about, uh, again on this other map here, are all against the land of Israel. And they want to cut the name of Israel off, and Israel may be no more. 
it says there in Psalm 83. You also have a similar account of this attack in the prophet Obadiah. He's only got one little chapter, but Obadiah is firmly cast at the time of the end, because at the end of Obadiah, that single chapter, you get the picture and the statement that the kingdom is the Lord's. So whatever happened in the early part of Obadiah is something which takes place before the kingdom becomes the Lord's. And what have they done, these people who are prophesied against, the Edomites and uh, their friends? They've been violent to their brother Jacob. That's what happened. You shouldn't have done this. You foreigners entered the gates, cast lots for Jerusalem. You were like one of them. The strangers carried off his wealth. Well, this appears to be exactly the same as Zechariah 14, where the enemy comes into Jerusalem, takes away the wealth, and takes away uh, people there. And lo and behold, if you want another confirmation, you've also got Ezekiel 35, which we read recently in our readings. And know, talked about Mount Seir and the people of Edom, or the Arab peoples. Uh, and this is what happens, because you cherished perpetual enmity and gave over the people of Israel to the power of the sword at the time of their calamity, at the time of their final punishment. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord, I will prepare you for blood. So it's the time of their final punishment. And phrases like calamity are used to describe it. Not very pleasant at all. So if we come back to Psalm 83, this is what the words say. Don't keep silence, O God. Do not hold your peace or be still. Your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you have raised their heads. They lay crafty plans against your people. They consult together against your treasured ones. They say, come, let us wipe them out as a nation, that the name of Israel be remembered no more. Now, you, the people of ISIS have said these exact words, and they are laying crafty plans, as I've shown you on that map, which shows much of uh, the Middle East in black. Those are the aims of these people to conquer them, to conquer Israel, to conquer the rest of the Middle East. Um, they conspire with one con accord, they make a covenant with the tents of Edom, Israelites, Mo. Here's a list of the names which you've already gone through, and uh, the Hagarites and the uh, Assyrian, there we are at the moment, the ones in red on this uh, list here, the Hagarites, Gebel and Asher, I think are the ones which at the moment correspond to ISIS. So what have we got here? We have uh, an attack against Israel. I, I think we have to be prepared for it, uh, because I know there is a, a view in our community that, you know, Israel will remain firm and sure right to the end and uh, will be defeated, will never be defeated and will always repel any invader. But that's not the picture which these prophecies give us. These are telling us that the day is coming when Israel will be smashed by the invader. Now, who is this invader? Well, it could be ISIS. It could be someone else. And I'm not going to say dogmatically that it is ISIS. Uh, but it certainly looks like it could be. Because nobody else has their power, their control, their fanaticism, and their terrorism that uh, they are inflicting on the world. If you come back to Zechariah 14, when the people have been carried away captive, the Lord intervenes and goes and fights against those nations as when he fought on the day of battle. But we're not told how much later this event is. You, you pretend to read it and think it all happens in one day. It doesn't. To be taken to captive and to have plunder taken and uh, going to captivity takes time. So there's a period of suffering for the people of Israel as they will be taken captive. Then one day the Lord Jesus will come and his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives uh, and the Lord Jesus will be here. And we hope for that day, we long for it, when the Mount of Olives uh, and the land will be changed and become radically different to that which is uh, existing now. So that, I believe, is how we should regard ISIS, that they could very well be the controlling power behind this invasion of Israel 
in the last days which will be successful. Now I could be wrong, it might be somebody else, but someday, sooner or later, someone's going to do it. And whether it's ISIS or someone else doesn't really matter. Uh, that day will only hasten the day of the Lord Jesus. And when the Lord Jesus is back, we have that other picture in Ezekiel 38 of a war which Israel will win because Jesus has returned and when Ezekiel 38 comes into play, he's already king in the land. And they've got immense wealth from the successful judgment on these nations by the Lord Jesus and uh, they come and attack Israel, whoever these people are in Ezekiel 38, which is, of course, a different story. So, in summary... ISIS and Bible prophecy, questions need to be asked and answered. How big will ISIS get? Well, the way it's going is going to become enormous and take over a significant part of the world. How will it affect the world? How will ISIS affect the world? And it's going to affect it in a very bad way. And, uh, you know, every country in the world is going to end up terrified of these people. Um, will ISIS be the power which will take Israel and Jerusalem at the time of the end? Well, it could be. It looks that way. But again, you know, it's, we're not meant to be predicting the future accurately. All we have prophecy for in the scriptures is to see the events as they take place and say, well, okay, that's obviously the fulfillment of that one. It isn't so we can all be prophets and say this will happen and that will happen. And of course, the final question is, have we to fear ISIS? And I suppose, from a scriptural point of view, the answer is no, because we have to put our trust in God, realizing that whatever happens will be the best in planning his purpose, in working out his purpose, and therefore, when terrible things happen in this world, we have not to be afraid, but rather lift up our heads, because our redemption is drawing near.